Last time, we looked at how a two-position value at risk was calculated in an Excel example. This time, we start to code this in MQL5. Stay tuned. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. As a trader, you'll benefit from cost-effective market access via multiple trading platforms and APIs. These enable trading and investing in any US stock, over 60 of the most liquid futures contracts, FX and CFDs. You can even diversify your portfolio by buying and selling other traders' strategies as investable assets themselves. So, if all of that sounds interesting, learn more by clicking on the link top right now or find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. By coding value at risk in MQL5 means we'll be able to get access to the most recent price data for assets and therefore calculate the metrics required for value at risk in real time, such as the standard deviation and correlation values. The code I use is just for illustration purposes and to explain the concepts, but this could be adapted for use in your own scripts and EAs if that's what you choose to do. So let's take a look. So the basic high level architecture of this module is as it was in the previous coding exercise where we looked at a single asset. So we're using that same class. We have the same constructor and the same methods already in here from that example. But I've already made a couple of changes. So as well as the standard deviation periods, we're also going to have a number of periods for the correlation, which is independent of this. So we can choose different values if we wish to. And this is the method we used last time to get the standard deviation of returns for a particular asset. And I've added a similar one here to get the value of the correlation between two assets. So just a couple of minor changes there in the overall structure of the class. Now in the constructor here for the class, which of course gets instantiated when an object is created from this, I've added an extra parameter here, which is the number of periods for the correlation. And then the property that we saw a moment ago up here gets set with that value. And that means that this value is now available to all of the methods within the class. So really just a few foundational changes from what we had before. Now let's turn our attention to the method that does the actual calculation of value at risk. Here, now, instead of just accepting a single asset as a parameter, it now accepts an array. And this will allow us to pass in the asset names of two positions, and equally, the position size is also an array, so we can pass in both of the position sizes as part of that. And as you can see here, I've effectively duplicated what we had last time, with a second section here, one calculates the standard deviation of returns for the first asset and the other for the second. And if I briefly bring up the formula for the standard deviation of a portfolio, these will now represent these sigma one and sigma two values. So if this formula is unfamiliar to you, then I suggest you watch the previous episode where I go through and explain this in a lot more detail. And the quickest way of getting to that episode is by using the description below the video, and that will provide you with a link to the playlist for this particular series, where you'll see all of the episodes in order. Now, I've kept this as two separate sections for now, just for clarity and to aid understanding. However, in future episodes where we look at the calculation for any number of positions, we'll convert this into a loop so that it doesn't matter how many there are, we'll calculate the standard deviation for each and every one of those positions. Now, this next section here is completely new. And in a similar way to how we made a call to calculate the standard deviation of returns here, we're now going to get the asset correlation. And we pass that three parameters. 
The first is the name of the first asset. The second is the name of the second asset. And then we're also passing in this double variable here by reference, which gets set in the method and we can then access from this location in the code. So let's now take a look at this particular method. Okay. In many respects, this is very similar to the function we used above here to calculate the standard deviation of returns. However, there's one main difference, and that is based around the necessity to ensure that we are looking at common bars in each of the assets. So basically what this comment is saying here, it is absolutely essential if you're going to have a meaningful correlation that we ensure beyond any doubt that the bars in each asset are synced. Now, where this could be a problem is if one asset trades at slightly different times to an other asset, and so there would be some bars in one asset, but not in the other. That is absolutely disastrous for any correlation calculation. Because remember, we're not looking at the correlation of prices here. We're looking at the correlation of the change in prices. And so get that wrong, and the results are meaningless. They'll be pretty much random. So that's why there's extra code in this particular function to make sure that each bar that is compared in the correlation calculation is genuinely from the same time period. Now, again, in the same way as with the standard deviation, I'm starting at bar one, not bar zero. And the reason for that is because bar zero is not yet a complete bar. So this while loop that you see here basically goes around until we've processed the number of bars that we've been asked to based on the correlation periods that was passed into the constructor. So we do a quick check here just to make sure about the availability of data and to make sure that we properly have access to that. And this is the part of the calculation that makes sure we're looking at like for like bars in the data. And if for any reason they do not sync up with the same start time for the bar, then we increment the bar that we're looking at either for one asset or the other until they do. And as soon as that's the case, we can then store the information about those price changes for each asset in these arrays that you see here. And to do that, we simply look at the difference between the open price of that bar and the closed price of that bar. Now, I don't convert these to percentages here because that's just an unnecessary overhead in the code. Because at the end of the day, we're just comparing relative values here between the two assets. So it's fine here to use absolute values. It just makes the code quicker. Now, when we've got to the end of this loop, i.e. we have got the required number of periods stored in these two arrays, we then make use of a standard MQL5 function called math correlation Pearson. This is going to calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient and we pass it two arrays, the array for position A and position B. And we pass in this third parameter by reference, which means it gets set by the procedure that's called. And this in turn was passed in by reference here, which means that this value is now available to us here. Now we will go on next time to look at the full calculation of var, but for now we're just going to exit the calculate var method prematurely, but not before putting out a message box with the value that we've calculated. So let's go ahead now and take a look at the script that's going to consume this risk management module. And there's just a couple of changes here as well. I've got an additional input parameter for the number of periods to use for the correlation coefficient. That number then gets passed into the class constructor as we saw a moment ago. And this time, instead of having the asset as an input parameter, I've simply set up two arrays, one for the names of the assets that we're going to look at and one for the lot sizes. So let's just change these so that 
their difference. So we've got Euro Yen and Euro Pound and the lot sizes here are signed lot sizes. And so if this is a positive value, it means we're holding the position long. If it's a negative value, it means we're holding the position short. And that will be imperative next time when we go on to calculate the VAR and determine whether we need to use the normal correlation coefficient or the reverse of that if we're holding these positions in opposite directions. Now, this message box here will not get printed out because we're returning false from the calculate VAR uh, method at the moment, if you remember right here. So this is the message box that we will get. So let's go ahead now and compile the script. So that's compiled with zero errors and zero warnings. So let's now turn our attention to MT5 and we'll run this script and we'll stick with the defaults using a um, daily basis for the calculations. So daily bars, 21 periods for the calculation of the standard deviation of each of those individual assets and 42 days, so effectively two trading months, to calculate the correlation coefficient between the two assets. On OK. And so we can now see that the correlation between Euro Yen and Euro Pound is 0.64. So a relatively high value there, probably driven by the fact that the base currency here in both of these is the Euro. If instead we come back to our script here and choose another asset that will be not so correlated, so let's say Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, recompile, come back. We can see now that the correlation here is much less, 0.25, but still a positive correlation in this case. So in the next episode, we'll return to this script and the risk management module, and we'll complete the calculation of the value at risk using that correlation coefficient that we've just calculated. Okay, so I'm hoping that you're finding this useful. Please do give me a thumbs up if you are. And if you want to find anything more out about DarwinX and the services that we offer to traders, then you can click on the link at the bottom right here. But now until next time, Trade safe.